Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Q&A, so let me put my hat on. Uh, get to this first question, and let's get this started. Alright. Jason, why do trainers know nothing about training and they are locked in their stupid bro science? It's because I was working in a gym with a guy who was a trainer, and when I tried to explain to him about the full body training and what is best for naturals, he literally fired me, and after a couple days he said, to me to get out of the gym. I don't understand what I did, uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, truth be told, yeah, I mean, that might have been why he fired you. The thing is, a lot of times these trainers are caught up in all the nonsense that's come out of the bodybuilding industry, the magazines, everything else. Because for a lot of people, for a couple decades, that was the only real source of information other than sports training. Uh, now, people who maybe played football or whatever, they had football coaches who had them on different types of training than what's being promoted in these gyms. But because the supplement industry and the bodybuilding magazines have been the biggest public outreach for working out, the whole idea of body part splits and everything has become the norm in gym culture. Furthermore, if we then imply that all the people who are in these magazines, all the people who are promoting these supplements are on tons of gear, well, you've got a bigger problem too because these things are all financially connected to the gyms also. Uh, the other thing to consider is that a lot of trainers uh, use gear, depending if they're relatively jacked. I would say 50% of personal trainers I've met in my life are on anabolics. They don't want you basically letting their clients know that they use gear or whatever with the way that you're saying things like that. So if they've got great results on a, a split routine, uh, which has become the norm, it could imply to their clients, if you're saying that, that they're on gear and the gear might have been responsible for a lot of their gains, not necessarily their knowledge, or they might take that as a personal insult because that's the way they train, that's the way they promote. So you're giving knowledge contrary to what their professional opinion is, what they utilize and what they help people train with. And so for them, they might take that as a personal insult or maybe even think that you're wrong and spreading bad knowledge. Now, there's a lot of factors going on here, brother, but you need to remember uh, when you work for people, even if you know more than the people who you work for, and that will oftentimes be the case in life when you do different things, letting them know that, uh, not always good if you make them feel stupid or you try to, you come across in a way that uh, they just completely disagree with. Basically, being smarter than the people you work for is something that you need to be careful of unless you know what you're doing with it. Unless they specifically hired you because you're smarter than them and you have to occasionally remind them, hey, uh, you hired me for this job because I'm smarter than you. Why don't you let me do my job? And we've all had to do that at certain points, but if that's not why they hired you, probably not a good idea. All right, next question. Other than increasing carb intake, is there any other ways to increase physical and mental performance? Work, weight training, and everything uh, have been particularly taxing lately, and I find myself running out of energy. Thanks. Uh, are you losing weight? Are you maintaining weight? If you're losing weight and you're dealing with a lot of work, a lot of training, yeah, you probably need more carbs. Uh, also factor in, are you getting enough sleep? If you're not getting enough sleep, you need to quit worrying about finding stuff to energize you. Find a way to get more rest so that your body and your mind recover more. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. It's hard to say with what you have going on because you haven't mentioned fluctuations in body weight. You didn't mention how much sleep you're getting. Those are the first things that I would look at. If you don't want to lose body weight or you're going through a stressful time, under eating isn't a good thing. Uh, I can understand that if someone's on a cut, but you need to understand when you're on a cut, if you have a stressful life, uh, it, the, the stress is going to affect you probably not the best time to be doing so unless it's a very slow cut. So I would ask, are you, are you maintaining body weight or not? If you're losing weight and you can't cope with the stress, then maybe you need to quit your cut. If it's giving, making you so low energy that it's affecting your work and your career, things like that, uh, maybe reassess what it is that you're trying to do, what you want out of your life. But otherwise, the first things I would look at, assuming you're maintaining weight, start looking at your sleep, your rest. Are you recovering enough and if you're not that explains low energy i mean if you're going through a lot of physical stress a lot of mental stress and your energy levels are coming down uh, it's simply a matter of getting enough rest and sleep is probably a big factor and the lack of sleep will affect you psychologically it will affect your mood and it will affect your physical energy so uh, look into that you need to be getting eight hours a night all right next question hey big jason a couple of months back i decided to give five three one a go well, another go. 
went through your old videos on it and I've been doing the 531 uh, Big But Boring template for just over four months now. I'd say my strength has plummeted uh, from only doing one heavy set a day. I know this could be a multitude of other factors and Big But Boring isn't a primary strength program, uh, but I didn't expect to be losing strength. I want to be as strong as a mofo. Any recommendations at all? Um, I don't know what you switched from. When I read the comment, I thought you were doing one heavy set every day on your big lifts. So I was going to have a different answer. But when I actually read this through, uh, after I had some coffee, before I started uh, answering these questions, uh, it's too hard to say. Uh, why is your strength plummeting? Well, you're still doing a peak set and you're doing a fair amount of volume. Your strength shouldn't be plummeting. Strength shouldn't be plummeting at all. Are you gaining weight? Are you losing weight? Uh, what's going on? Because technically all your big exercises, if you're doing the big but boring template, are getting a lot of volume uh, from the other stuff that you're doing. But that's also kind of a size thing. The boring but big is designed to get you bigger. Uh, but your strength should be going up because you should be gaining size and you're getting a heavy peak set. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you're just not getting enough total work in. Maybe not enough heavy work. In which case, the big but boring template might not be ideal for you. Uh, you might not be getting enough sleep. You might not be getting enough sleep. might not be getting enough food. If you're losing body weight, that could explain it. So again, you didn't give me any details here. What do you have going on in your life? Anytime you're losing strength on a program that has a reasonable following, uh, that seems to be reasonably effective for a decent number of people, shouldn't be an issue there shouldn't be an issue there so you need to look into what other factors you have going on are you getting enough sleep what's your nutrition look like are you losing weight are you getting enough calories now failing that you're saying again so it sounds like you've run this program before you didn't say anything about losing strength before i have seen some fairly strong lifters and i knew a coach who coached drug-free guys a lot a lot of strength athletes and uh, rugby players and some power lifters and he doesn't like 531. He felt that for his natural guys, some of them lost strength on it. Uh, he, and that, that's the case. It only seems to be a good template or a good program for about 50% of natural guys. Uh, but you shouldn't be losing strength on it unless you're already a very powerful athlete who is drug free. You would, you're getting towards the advanced phase and then you switch to a program like this. You might see some regression in strength, but it shouldn't be uh, like you're describing as plummeting, like all your lifts going down, because that's what it sounds like. Uh, so again, you didn't tell me much about your training experience, where your lifts are at, what your lifestyle looks like, so it's, or what you were doing before, so it's kind of hard to assess. But these are things that anyone should be assessing when they go on a training program. And if it's not any of these factors, then maybe it's not the right program for you. Switch to something else. All right, next question. I'm considering starting your ice cream fitness 5x5 program. Will it help me build uh, strength and visible muscle? I had started classic strong lifts, but I feel it's missing muscle groups. Is your ice cream fitness program going to help me? Honest answers, please. Yeah, the ice cream fitness 5x5 is meant to be a maximum size program. Uh, it is basically what I did. I took some of the minimalist 5x5s that people have come out with and reverted them back to the original idea behind them. Uh, strong lifts is basically, people are always like, you, you ripped off strong lifts. Strong lifts ripped off other programs. I looked at what strong lifts did and undid some of the damage that it did by removing too much stuff, uh, probably making it a little too minimalist for most people's goals, uh, other than just getting really good at the squat. Probably a fantastic squat program, but as far as a lot of your other lifts goes, just not enough weekly workload and a lot of muscles are not getting worked effectively enough they're not getting enough volume so i adjusted that to compensate so yeah it should be fine but keep in mind the workload is so high on my novice five by five in the same way that a lot of the old school five by fives were too much that about one in four people struggle to recover from it so i can't guarantee you're going to get good results on it but probably a 70 to 80 percent chance that you will if you follow it right and you eat enough honest answer all right next question isn't a Romanian deadlift a far more superior exercise than deadlifts because you don't stress your central nervous system that much and has less chance of injury and it's more posterior chain dominant. Also, RDLs can overload more traps and backs because you can put more volume. Uh, no, the Romanian deadlift will work your overall back less, 
because it, you're not able to do quite as much weight and it's not better for the posterior chain, it's better for the hamstrings. The conventional deadlift is actually better for your glutes uh, and it's better for your overall back development as far as your middle and upper back and everything goes. It's actually totally better. Uh, the Romanian deadlift is a superior exercise for putting meat on your hamstrings. It's probably a better hamstring exercise. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the direct work, the stretch reflex involved in the hamstrings, as well as the uh, less impact on your recovery. But if you're talking about just putting on more overall size on the big muscles, glutes, uh, middle traps, uh, thoracic erectors, even lats, a lot of that stuff, uh, the conventional deadlift will flat out beat it, even if you're doing less total uh, sets and reps per week. It will flat out beat it for that. Uh, the Romania is, is, is fantastic for building up the hamstrings and is a great accessory for just putting meat on your spinal erectors and your lower back. I would say that's where it excels. Uh, but as far as just overall size and some of those other muscles, uh, no, not necessarily. It's not necessarily the case. All right, next question. Hey brother, there is something which I feel now. I have been training for like seven years and I have been training hardcore. I am natural, a natural who now feels issues with his knees, elbow joints, and feels disturbed to even think about heavy squatting. Please advise me on what I should do and, and how I should alter my training methods. Well, here's the other thing. You know, you said you're hardcore and now you have aching joints, aching tendons. Uh, that's the reality. Hardcore training isn't that great for naturals. Uh, in the sense of hardcore training means it sounds like you've been doing excessive amounts of isolation, poor straps, all that sort of stuff, all this stuff these hardcore guys talk about. Uh, realistically, you're drug free. If you want to go back and do things right, you need to go on a better, more balanced program. I have multiple programs out there. Uh, you probably need to go to something that is more full body oriented, uh, something that creates balance between your muscle groups. You need to learn to start paying attention to deloading, avoiding exercises that inflame uh, tendons, everything else, because that's the problem. You're getting older. You've been training seven years, and now you're finding out that a lot of these hardcore training methods that people promote basically just lead to pain and injury. And they don't necessarily lead to any better gains, in some cases worse. Because if you're busted up all the time, I promise you, you're not making more gains. Uh, the way most of these guys who do hardcore training make better gains uh, when they're hurt and busted up and can't always lift more or do anything heavy you now, they just up the dose. They just use more drugs. That's how they get around it. Or they wrap everything up and fight through the pain. No, you just need to get a more balanced training. I have tons of videos on these topics about how to balance training, how to have balanced muscle groups, uh, more functional exercises, uh, proper deloading, paying attention to connective tissue joints, stuff like that. None of that's hardcore, but it will keep you in the game and keep you strong and keep you big 20 years, 30 years longer than the other stuff will. And that's the name of the game is longevity. You now you're finding that out. You've been training seven years and now you're finding out that this hardcore training bullshit is just that. It's bullshit. All right, next question. Hey Jason, the UK papers are full of stories about swimmer Adam Petey and his recent achievements. They are saying his body fat is 6% and that going that lean is dangerous for non-athletes. With that in mind, uh, are athletes immune to the dangers of, of being that lean uh, with the risk of crash hormone levels and organ failure? It sounds wrong to me and it's sending out a dangerous message for young people, so I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Thanks. Alright, I looked at the guy. Uh, I went to Google Images, typed in his name. I don't see any 6% body fat guys anywhere under that name. So maybe they have him confused with someone else. Or the more likely answer is like everyone else, people go get a, a bod pod or they get a skin fold and it comes back 6% body fat and then they tell everyone that they're 6% body fat. He, he's like 11 or 12% body fat. Uh, and anyone who looks at images and knows what, what people have come back on DEXA scans that is not a sub 10% body fat guy. Now, the reason they say that for non-athletes, because you know what it takes for most men who aren't very athletic and lift weights to get to 6% body fat? They have to starve themselves. You have to be an anorexic. So truth be told, yeah, you basically have to turn into an anorexic to be 6% body fat or 7% body fat for the vast majority of men. Some athletes gravitate to relatively lean body fats, even under 10%, just because their conditioning work is so high 
they burn through so many calories that a lot of them struggle to consume enough calories to maintain their fat because they do so much carb loading. And here's the thing, this is kind of what I've been trying to tell people. When your energy turnover is insanely high and you eat mostly carbs, uh, the nutrient partitioning is a bit different. You are going to struggle to gain body fat if your activity level is high enough. If you do that much cardio and conditioning, uh, you have to remember surplus carbs don't really turn to fat. It's fat in your body that does. And the problem is that obviously most people on balanced diets, it's not going to work. A lot of athletes carb load harder for heavier performance, so they end up on relatively low fat diets and they do huge amounts of conditioning work and they tend to get a lot leaner over time uh, no matter what they do with that. But you need to keep in mind, we're not talking about 30 minutes a day and an hour a day in the gym. We talk about lots of conditioning work. We're talking about people who are doing hours of conditioning a day. Uh, and there's a big difference. And again, someone who's training that way, they will tend to get lean in the long term, irrespective of having high calories. With oftentimes, these are people who are eating 3,000 plus calories every day and still getting lean. The average person is only going to get that lean through anorexia, and that's generally what you're seeing. It's done just through nutrient partitioning and energy turnover over years. Uh, big difference there. Uh, all right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.